Here is briefly, okay, this is now thinking about us as Christians in the world. Um, here is where I think we can begin to step in with some answers that either kind of complement what the answers might be in Barbie or kind of offer some where there aren't any, okay? We can start in this kind of world by saying, here is why actually much of the aim of feminism and therefore in our culture is absolutely right. So we can agree with a lot of the message of feminism, right? And it's always good when we can to say to the culture, yes, we're with you, we agree. Equality for women, women is a good thing, we agree. And then we can say to our non-Christian friends or family, so what's the basis of your views on that? Why do you think women should be equal to men? Because scientifically speaking, it's difficult to make that case. In the same way that it's difficult to make the case that any human being is equal to another human being. Because actually, we're not all equal. We're not born equal. We're born, some of us are physically stronger. Some of us are more intelligent. Some of us are born somewhere with more money. Some of us are born in a geographically better place, which puts us at an advantage. And we're not equal at all. So what is your basis, i.e. a non-Christian basis, for thinking that women should be equal to men or are equal to men? Because we agree that they should be and are, but we think we have a reason why they are. What's your reason? Do you see what I mean? So we can begin to push back and say, what, on what basis do you think women are equal to men? And it's not always easy for people to come up with an answer. However, I think we can say, this is why we think women should, are equal to men. We have a basis. Firstly, Christian faith can affirm the goodness and difference of being male and female because we believe God has made us male and female. That's not a very trendy belief, but we believe that God has made us male and female. And whatever our particular interpretation of Genesis, and there are feminist ones and there are patriarchal ones and there are ones in between, Whatever our interpretation of Genesis 1 and 2, it's very, very difficult to avoid the conclusion that God has created human beings as two distinct and complementary sexes. And that therefore both are created equal in worth and dignity, and that both are in the image of God. And therefore if both are made in the image of God, that also reminds us that God is not male, and male is therefore not God. God is not gendered because he is spirit and he is God. He is beyond gender. We use gendered language to describe God because we are human and God is God and he has kindly condescended himself to our minuscule brains in revealing himself through his word and in the person of Jesus in certain categories. So language of father is male but it's only ever partial, it's analogy, right? So that's our reason we can say women are equal. We can gently and clearly affirm what we believe about God's good design and creation of male and female. And it turns out that we have science on our side. Richard Dawkins recently, no fan of the Christian faith, as we all know, has recently kind of lost a lot of friends by saying, no, no, scientifically, sex is binary. It's male and female. There are, of course, a tiny, tiny proportion of people born into sex, but that doesn't change the scientific binary, binary of male and female. Um, just very briefly, I was chatting to some church leaders the other day, who, uh, one of whom was in, uh, had a friend who's ministering in Newcastle, massive student church, biggest student church, uh, certainly in the Northeast, probably one of the biggest in the country. They are seeing students come to faith through their teaching on these kind of issues because they want some clarity on the issues. So the assumption that, uh, that emerging generations will be put off by us having a little bit of confidence and clarity in what we believe on these issues is often misguided. Um, actually, some confidence, gentle and humble, of course, is attractive. Okay, second thing, because we know what a man is and what a woman is, both sexes, in our view, can be free to complement one another, right? I think it's a bit sad in the film, and again, it's only half a story, but it's a bit sad in the film that they discover that it's bad when, when men dominate women and bad when women dominate men, 
but they don't seem to, at least in the film, come to a conclusion that it's great if they could work together. The answer is to find it in themselves and further atomization and further individuality. Do you see what I mean? And there's a kind of separation rather than a coming together and a complementing of the sexes. And actually in Christianity, we can see we're, we're, we are better off together. Turns out we complement one another quite well. Um, and I think we can be confident in speaking of that complementarity. When I use the word complementarity, by the way, for those versed in kind of intra-Christian arguments about complementarianism, egalitarianism, I'm not talking about that kind of thing, like the roles of men and women, I'm just talking about our complementarity, the way that we complement one another as male and female. We need one another. Last point on this, and this goes back to the trans issue, precisely because male and female are not identical, as we believe it, society is diminished if one is trampled on and has no voice. But if male and female are the same, if, if we're the same, well, actually nothing is lost if one is erased from the picture. There we go. Third thing, uh, we can offer hope and actual good news. And this is what I'd like us to, to dwell on as we, as we kind of chat further about this. So, to the exasperated feminist or woman like America Ferreira in the film, that speech we've just watched, to that woman that's feeling like that and feels it too much, we can say some wonderful things. We can say with our whole hearts that the way of Jesus casts you, that woman, those women, as of infinite worth before you do a thing. Before you are a mum, or a high-flying exec, or neither, or both, before you are fat or thin, this God is not waiting for you to be perfect. Your juggling that you can't cope with can be dropped. We have a good news message which is m way more than just solidarity, it's more than just empathy. It's your creator declaring you beloved because he's made you, he loves you, he's rescued you. He's rescued you from your imperfections because you're not perfect. He's rescued you from the demands the world places on you to be perfect. That is, I, I hear America for our speech and I go, surely that is, a, that is a message that women and all of us need to hear. And we can bring that message to people. Second thing we can say to people, more than that, than we just heard, this God came for women in a radically inclusive way. So think of the women just briefly. I did just briefly off the top of my head that in the Jesus story, right? Anna in the temple before he was born, to Elizabeth, his aunt, to Mary, his mother, to the prostitutes, to Mary and Martha, those friends of his, to the outcast Samaritan woman, to the upper-class Phoebe who ran a church from her house, to the apostle Junior. All of these women, and more that I haven't mentioned, all of these women are, are hugely part of Jesus ministry and life in a world which really, really was patriarchal. So Jesus and his followers are for women. And it's why the places in the world where oppression of women is greatest tend to be the places which forbid Christianity. And so why Christians have historically been at the forefront of protecting women. Of course, as I say all this, I'm aware that Christians have also got things wrong in regards to women. We've been far from perfect but we're there when we're outlawing the burning of widows in India in the 19th century or the binding, binding of Chinese girls' feet in the early 20th century. Jesus is for women. Last thing about this that we can say to the world, in a world of sexual violence against women, and that's a really interesting point in the film when Barbie goes into the real world, she's never felt objectified until she goes into the real world and she suddenly feels an undercurrent of violence. It's quite funny the way they put it, but it's actually really powerfully put. So in a world of sexual violence, Jesus offers a beautiful alternative to that. And, you know, as a dad of three daughters, the stats on male, se male sexual violence are, are, are horrific and sickening. Uh, one in four women will experience sexual abuse before 18. And we, as we hear that, are shocked, rightly. Most humans in history wouldn't be shocked by that. In Latin, did you know this? There are 25 words for prostitute and one for male virgin. Those two facts are connected. Um, in most ancient civilizations, women's bodies belong to men. The gods of Rome were violent rapists. 
Um, in the Christian revolution, Paul says to Christian men in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 4, something everyone would have agreed with. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband, and the whole world and all the ancient civilizations say yea. He then carries on in 1 Corinthians 7 and says, in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his body, but yields it to his wife. Crazy talk. It's a Christian sexual revolution for women. And so Louise Perry, uh, who I've mentioned before, non-Christian author, Tom Holland, agnostic historian, they are both very clear that the seismic change in attitudes towards sex and the value of women's bodies stems directly from the teaching of Jesus and the spread of Christianity in the world. And it's why even in our post-Christian society we don't condone paedophilia or rape. That's the kind of two taboos in our society, isn't it, sexually? They're the only two things that are kind of beyond the pale. Why? Because we think consent is the thing. And you can't consent with paedophilia. Children aren't able to consent legally, and rape clearly is not consensual. And yet, consent isn't enough. Um, we see it time and again in the, in the lurid stories of Russell Brand or Harvey Weinstein or any other powerful man that we've come across. Consent pretends that all sexual encounters are merely rational, transactional encounters between two equals. And that is actually almost never the case in every respect. It's why Louise Perry, again, non-Christian feminist, now she looks at the sex ethic of Christianity, which says lifelong marriage is the best context for sex, and she says, yes, that is the best for women. So, we have a gospel that saves women, that values women, and that protects women. And I think gives an amazing answer to the issues raised by Barbie. We've got some questions to discuss on your sheets.